According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the average Australian makes about $1,900 a week. Know what an entry-level MP makes? Almost $4,500 a week, more than double the average Australian. I have scanned through over a thousand pages of disclosures from Australian politicians, which is a treasure chest of data to understand how they manage their finances. I know how many houses they own, what stocks they've bought, who they bank with, how they structure their mortgages, and a range of other insights. I'll be covering all of this in this video. So why does it matter? Well, those of you in the investing space will know Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House in the US. She is an expert stock picker, not because of her innate sense of the market, but because her role as Speaker gives her the ability to change laws and influence policy, which of course affects stock performance. If the politicians are doing something, we should probably do it as well, as they're the ones closest to the laws and will take action to improve their own finances. So let's start by looking at house ownership. In Australia, there are currently 155 MPs. Collectively, they own over 350 houses, on average 2.3 properties per MP. If we break this down by party, national MPs tend to have the greatest number at an average of 2.7 properties per MP. This is followed by independents at 2.5, Labour at 2.3, and Liberals just behind at 2.27. What I've found is that many MPs own property both in their home state and in Canberra, but as the averages show, many MPs are going well beyond that. So MPs are certainly big investors in property, but it's not hard to see why, given that these are the people that directly help the value of Australia's housing stock to increase 60% over the past five years alone. If we look at Australia's rate of house price growth versus inflation since 1986, the price of housing has increased roughly six times faster. So politicians with an average of 2.3 properties each are certainly reaping the rewards here. If we isolate just invest in properties, the Liberals are the biggest owners with just over one per MP. Labour were just behind at an average of 0.94 investment properties per MP. National has a high rate of property ownership, but a relatively lower investment rate as many of their MPs operate several farming properties. Many of these were classified as residential, so I've assumed they are not investment properties in this study. Looking by state now, Tasmanian MPs have the highest average at three properties per MP. South Australia was high too at 2.5, with New South Wales not far behind on 2.48. The state with the largest collection of investment properties again was Tasmania, and New South Wales at an average of 1.4 and 1.125 apiece. Northern Territory and ACT MPs were much more tame with an average of one home and no investment properties at all. So Australian MPs love their houses. They often own a few and the centre-right parties tend to have higher rates of home ownership. Just eight MPs owned no property at all, including Stephen Bates and Max chandler Mather from Greens, who are among the youngest in Parliament. It's likely that they haven't got to the stage in life yet where they want to buy their first homes. So now let's look at who the MPs have their super with. It was unfortunate to see just 83 MPs disclose who their super was with. Australian super was the most popular, with roughly a third of MPs saving through them. 21 MPs had a self-managed super fund, often through complex company and trust structures. MPs with a self-managed super fund owned an average of 3.4 properties, showing a correlation between having more assets and getting into more complex super setups. For example, Kevin Hogan and Andrew Gee own property through their super funds, and there are others too. There has to be some advantage to doing this, and we'll get into that later in the video. Host Plus was also popular with 5 MPs, Uni Super 2 with 4, followed by AMP, Art, and Hester with 3 MPs each. Now let's explore MPs' banking relationships. MPs have a lot of banking relationships with their checking, savings, business, offset, mortgage, and electorate accounts. Let's first look at the checking and savings accounts, of which 142 MPs gave the data. The big four banks were the four most common among MPs, of course. CBA came out on top by some margin, with 52 MPs banking with them. NAB came in second with 32, ANZ third with 26, 
and Westpac fourth with 25. ING, Bendigo, St George and Macquarie featured strongly as well. MPs are loyal to their smaller regional banks too. 73% of St George's MP customers are from New South Wales. 50% of BOQ and 67% of Suncor customers are from Queensland. 54% of Bendigo's customers are from Victoria and BankSA is exclusively used by MPs from South Australia. By party, Labour have a strong preference for Commonwealth Bank. National like NAB and Westpac and the Liberals prefer NAB. The Greens have an affinity for Bank Australia, likely due to their B Corp accreditation and social angle. Over on the mortgages side, of 147 MPs that own property, just 129 of them have a mortgage. So that means that 18 MPs have no mortgage debt. Eight of these are Liberal MPs, four are independents and four are Labour. For those with mortgages, Commonwealth was again the most preferred for MPs, with 30 MPs having mortgages with them. NAB was again second with 24. Westpac slipped into third with 17 and Macquarie was at 14. ANZ slipped into fifth place with 10. So while ANZ was the third most popular bank for MPs to bank with, they're only the fifth most popular to have a mortgage with. Macquarie moved in the opposite direction, as only the eighth most popular banking partner, but the fourth most popular mortgage provider. What I found during the study is that MPs had several banking relationships. It was very common for them to split up their savings and mortgage bank providers. Macquarie are obviously doing a very good job here of pushing their mortgage product to MP customers that don't even have a normal savings and checking relationship. During my analysis, I also saw that many MPs use offset accounts alongside their mortgage. This behaves like a savings account, but instead of earning interest, it subsidizes the interest that you pay on your mortgage. For example, if you have a mortgage of a million dollars, but a $200,000 offset account, your mortgage interest would be calculated on $800,000 and not the full million. As many Australian mortgages are on floating rates, this can be a powerful strategy to save money on your mortgage. So the MPs know what they're doing. Let's now talk about investments. What I often found during this analysis was that many MPs came into their term holding several shares, but commonly sold out of them in their first year. Fortunately for us, many didn't and there are some interesting insights that we can see. I tried my best to pull this information together, both constant buying and selling disclosures, it wasn't a simple exercise. So take these numbers, just like all the numbers in this video, with a degree of caution. Roughly a third of MPs currently own share or fund investments. As a rough guide on stocks, banking and mining stocks were very popular. Telstra, Combank, ANZ, NAB and Westpac are owned by at least five MPs. Woodside, BHP, Rio Tinto, Woolworths and West Farmers feature strongly as well. In the ETF space, Vanguard is a clear favourite among MPs, with iShares also featuring. Crypto is owned by three MPs, with one of them even stating that they use Crypto.com, and another stating that they own Ethereum using CoinSpot. Outside of these, gold and private equity also made interesting additions. And finally, let's take a look at trusts. Along with self-managed super funds, trusts can be an interesting space for tax and asset structuring purposes. Those with trusts are likely to sit on a fair bit of wealth. Even better than a man in finance with a trust fund is a politician. They know their way around the law earn more than twice the national average and will always act to protect their wealth. In 2023, the ATO stated there were nearly 1 million trusts in Australia, or about one for every 26 Aussies. In the Australian Parliament, the rate jumps up to more than one for every two MPs. About a quarter of MPs are beneficiaries of these trusts and companies. Over in New Zealand, I did a similar analysis, with their numbers being much higher. 50% of their MPs had trusts and there were three for every four MPs. The Australian data will have a few companies in the mix as well, as I evaluated them based on their name to serve a similar purpose to a trust. Some MPs even have companies that are owned by their super fund. But what is clear here is that MPs are using trusts in greater quantities than the broader public. Why are they doing this? Well, it can only be for their own financial advantage. Intergenerational wealth transfer, tax avoidance, privacy, it is likely to be one of these. If we break it down by party, the Nats are doing very well with many more trusts than MPs. One MP is a trust king with a whopping 17 trusts. This of course skews the data and if we take him out of the equation, 
the number is much closer to the ratio in the Liberal Party. They have roughly two trusts for every three MPs, with many MPs doubling or even tripling up. Independents followed at a rate of one for every two MPs, and Labour down at one for every three MPs. So this stereotype for coalition MPs is fairly true. They own a lot of properties and tend to be beneficiaries of a few trusts. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to subscribe down below and I look forward to catching you on the next one. Cheers.